So let's go to Psalm 30, 1 through 12. Now, the good news is, typically I would do a verse by verse, try to get through it, and I just realized that I was preparing this message. There ain't no way on this side of heaven that's going to happen today. So I'm going to hit three select verses, maybe four out of this whole psalm. But I want to read the psalm with you this morning, so you can go home and say this on your own. Pull up a good commentary, maybe a, another uh, a pastor you hear on the uh, iPod or wherever you've got these days you listen to, and, and listen to that message. So I'm really, I'm really going to get into the application aspect of this because I'll give you some background, but because of the time, I realize I'm always up against time, right? And uh, it seems to always be the case, And but I'll try to be considerate, but I can't make any promises. How's that? We'll go with that. So would you stand this morning? As you, we go to Psalm 30, it's 3-0, and we're going to read this, and there's going to be a couple key verses I'm going to emphasize throughout this, so as we read God's Word, I would pray you would give uh, attention to it. Uh, if you have a pen and there's certain words in here as you're reading, you know, circle, I always circle my Bible all the time, it looks like a kid scratch all over the place, but it reminds me how when I read something, God speaks to my heart, I, I write that down right away. It helps me stay focused because it's easy to get lost in God's Word. You go from point to point, right? So, all right, let's get into it here this morning. Verse 1, I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called you for help and you, what? I circled that in my Bible. So here's a news flash or indication. We may talk about healing today in the sermon, just maybe, all right? O Lord, you have brought me up from the grave. You spare me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his praise. I love this. Praise his holy name. There is no one else like him. Amen? Number five. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. I love that. I love that verse. I should get you all charged up and ready to go this morning. Verse, yep. <laughs> Verse 6, when I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Oh, Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid my face, hid your face, I was dismayed. Verse 8, to you, O Lord, I cry. To the Lord, I cry for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction? Am I going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. Oh, Lord, be my help. I love that. Notice the humility here in David's tone, right? You turn my wailing into dancing. That's right. I said dancing in church because the Bible says it. You turn my wailing into dancing and you remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. Love that verse. That my heart may sing to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. And that should put a smile on your face and some steps to your feet this morning. Amen. May God add the blessing to this word, and you may be seated if you can. A little background here. I can't go into the whole contextual part of this, but I always like to know what happened before I get into the reading of God's word. What was the background? What was happening in David's life in this passage that... Uh, that caused him to get to this point. So in Psalm 31 through 12, many of the commentaries I read, it boils down to this. It was, according to this, it says he was going to dedicate the temple. He's thinking about the, the temple itself, right? But the thing you would not see if you just read the psalm is this happened after military successions. David had gone to war. David had, be, had won many wars. God had delivered David through many of his enemies. We'll talk more about that later on in the sermon. All right? So David was God in God's favorite place. He was giving him victory. All right? So David was glorying in his greatness in the kingdom that he had. David was realizing, hey, I did pretty good here. I defeated all these people. Life is good. By the way, since I've got so many people in my kingdom right now, let me go ahead and just issue a decree that I want to know how many people are serving me. Right? So I'm going to call a consensus. I want, I want to call a consensus, and I don't know how many people are serving me. Well, can I tell you that uh, God didn't like that? 
Joab, his army general, warned him that this action, if he took the consensus, the glory to himself would not be pleasing to God. So you don't get that when you just read that verse. So it helps you understand where we're heading, that he was down in the pit. David was about to find himself in trouble because he got up in God's face here a little bit, right? God delivered him, but David seemed to be taking the glory for what God did in David's life. Never happens to us, does it? Hmm. All right? See, if you're curious where this is all coming from, I don't want you to turn there. I don't have time to read it. Mark this verse down in your own personal Bible study. First Chronicles 21. The first five verses, you can study that later on today. You'll understand what happened with David and his consensus and not to bore the tears out of you, but what happened was because of David's arrogancy and his pride, the Lord gave David three choices of punishments. He gave him a choice. You want door number one, door number two, or door number three? I'm not going to tell you what all three were, and it's not the point. The point was David took door number three. David says, I'll take the three days of plague. All right, can I say that none of these are good choices? Not good options. Uh, talking about going into despair, into a pit, any of these three would put us into depression, right? And so it says in, in, the, in my notes here that um, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity, and he said to the angel who was destroying the people during this time, enough, draw your hand. God showed mercy to David. God didn't allow the full three days of calamity to take place. God told David, or told the angel, withdraw your sword, stop your calamity, I'm going to stop the discipline, and I'm telling you all that, but David, here's what you need to do. You need to go ahead and give me a burn, burn a sacrifice for me. Build an altar. So in 1 Chronicles 21, 26, the, the Bible says the Lord accepted his sacrifices and answered David with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offerings. So all that to say, all right, after David was disciplined, David was in the pit of despair. David found himself redeemed again, right? He, he was showing God's favor. But don't think for a minute that if God is delivering you, that you get any credit for it. We need to recognize that we have been rescued from this, our sin and we have done nothing to deserve it. We can't be good enough, we can't perform well enough, and we can't look good enough. Hello. Right? Regardless how good you look on a Sunday morning, you can't do it. So we come to this chapter. My sermon title is Rescuing and Re-Energizing. Do you need rescue this morning and you need re-energize? So as we go to point one, is, oh, it is working. Good job, Craig. Listen, I just want to give a shout out to the guys in back and the girls in back. If you've ever sat back there and things don't go well, what happens? You know what happens, right? What's your natural reaction? You all turn around and look at the guy in back, don't you? You know, heat's coming out of your eyes. So I just want to applaud them for their service to the Lord. And, and I know it's a... Uh, sometimes a thankless job, but if things don't go right, many times with the mics or it's not their fault, but they respond. And so I thank you for your, your service. I, I want you to know, I appreciate, and I know the people in this church appreciate your ministry as well. All right, back at it. So this psalm is all about redemption. This psalm is all about redeeming. So in the background, kind of shows you that with how David got to this place where it comes to verse 1. And my first point is this. Jesus rescues us from Satan. Write that down. You know, say, oh, that was good. Verse 1, right? David begins by praising the Lord in verse 1. I will exalt you. What does exalt mean? I will lift you up. I will praise your name. All right, what do we do for the last half hour, 45 minutes? We've exalted the name of the Lord. We praise his name, right? For you lifted me out of the depths. Anybody remember their salvation story? You were heading the wrong direction. You were in the depths of the pit of hell, heading the wrong direction, and God lifted you up. And then David says, and do not let my enemies gloat over me. Listen. I've already told you David was at war. David had tons of enemies, right? 
God had defeated many of his enemies, and those, those enemies throughout David's life was uh, people like Goliath or the Philistines, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Syrians. Uh, there's a heckler even in the group that used to harass him, right? And I have a hard time saying this, so forgive me. You can go check my pronunciation after Sir Shammai. I think that's how you say it, Shammai, right? King Saul. Saul's son, Ishobesheth. Say that one fast three times, right? And his own son, Absalom, one of David's head, right? David was battling evil. He wanted to bring him harm while David was trying to serve God and do the right things by God. And more and more people kept on trying to attack him. And so my first point was what? Jesus rescues us from Satan, right? It is he who lifts us out of the pit, according to David in this psalm. So David is praising God for protecting him. Praising him for sustaining him for the seven years of life as he went through this time of hardship. We go through three days of hardship and we want to throw in the towel, don't we? God has abandoned me. He hasn't abandoned you. You let your emotions control you. You're not listening to what God says in his promise. He will never forsake you. He will never abandon you, right? But see, I think, and that's why I have to get to it this morning quickly. I can't spend a whole lot of time going into a lot of back, more background. But here's the application in this verse. You ready? It's simply this. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Satan does not want you rescued. Satan wants to destroy you. Listen, I'm not trying to make you fearful. I'm just telling you in reality that we have a battle going on and we don't even know what's going on half the time. Nor do we care because we become desensitized to spiritual things. We're so busy with our lives. The Word of God reminds us that we have real enemies. We have real things and spirits in this life that want to do us harm. Satan who prowls around like a lion seeks to devour us in 1 Peter 5, 8. Those people that were trying to destroy David was not under the spirit of God, but some other spirit, right? Something else was going on. And some of you this morning, you're going through some hardships. You're going through some trials. And you feel like you're like David. That you're in the depths of the well. You're down in the hole. But I want to encourage this morning that even though we're at war, God will rescue us in this time. Wherever you're at, whatever you're going on, whatever's happening in your life. See, I believe this, and I didn't make this up. This is an old illustration. So if you'll, if you'll listen to this, forgive me if you've heard it many times before, but it applies to this passage. There are two types of Christians. There's the cruise ship Christians, and then there's the battle type Christians. See, David was a battleship Christian, all right? He stayed on it. Yeah, he messed up, but he stayed focused on the mission, right? So what are cruise-type Christians? I'm glad you asked. Cruise-type Christians kind of drift along, expect no hardship. They like luxury and comfort. They want people to serve them. Listen, my wife and I have been on several cruises. I got to tell you, I love it. Because when I go on a cruise, it's all about me. Right? It's all about how much food I can eat to appease my appetite. It's about all the entertainment I can handle. Right? It's about all the excursions of swimming out on the beach. And see, I'm just being honest. You don't even be honest with you. You love it too. Right? But you, you think during that time, my priority at that moment is to prepare for battle? I'm preparing for the next meal. I want to know I just had lunch, and I want to know what they're serving for dinner on the cruise. Because I want to be pampered and comforted. Right? I, I want to enjoy life's pleasures. And as I go through this life, I just make my way to heaven and arrive without any problems. That, my friends, is a cruise type Christian. One problem when problems come, when issues come, your ship sinks. You get a hole in the ship, right? But battle type Christians are those who are on a mission, those who understand 
that as a Christian, you've been given a mission from the commander, which is Christ, to go. To go, right? And do the things he's commanded throughout Scripture and make disciples, right? So here's what I would say. The battle-type Christian understands that you have a purpose. God has a plan for your life. Not just to exist, but to fulfill his purpose. The battleship Christian understands that sacrifice and hardship is part of your journey. I don't like that. Don't know we asked if we liked it. God didn't seem to care if we like it or not. But he does tell us that we will suffer persecution as part of being a Christian. So, be prepared. Be prepared. Because we know that life is fleeting, according to Ephesians 15, 16. And the days are evil. So you better make the most of the time and redeem the time and live this life. When you're going through life, you will have times where you'll be in the pit. But don't forget your calling. Don't forget that you've been redeemed. Don't forget that you have been rescued from the hands of Satan. That God has a purpose and a plan for your life, just like he did for David. See how simple this is? I told you this is simple. We are rescued from the hands of Satan. And our enemy is constantly firing darts at us. Maybe he'll use somebody in the church against you. Maybe somebody in a family member outside against you, right? Satan will use whatever threat he can to destroy this church. Let's be clear about that, all right? See, my concern is not those who understand they are battleship Christians. My concern are those who are, including myself, right? I'm concerned, I talk to myself. We're cruise-type Christians, right? Because Satan will leave you alone. You're no threat. You're not speaking the word of God. You're not doing anything to impact his influence in this world. So he's good. Why should I bother with you when someone else is preaching the gospel or sharing Christ or serving in a ministry that impacts others for the cause of Christ? See, Satan's goal is to keep people in the pit of despair. Christ is lifting them up out of the pit of despair and through repentance, salvation is available and to be redeemed. See, God is greater than our problems. There is real darkness in this world. There is real uh, evil in this world. In this world today, I did, looked up a couple facts about being rescued. Since I walked up to begin preaching, this is the stats I found. 12,252 people dying of hunger today in the world. An estimated 65,000 people were trafficked, sex trafficked, in the world today. 125,000 babies have been killed by abortion worldwide today. There is real evil in this world. Cults are going to go door to door. It's Easter time. They're going to knock on your door. And they're going to ask you to talk to you and hand you a track and tell you that they believe in God. But let me tell you, the God they believe in is not the God of the Bible. It is not the Christ who resurrected of the Bible. There's real evil. And they're, they're there to say they're to help you, but they will lead your soul to hell. We must be careful. Satan wants to cause you harm, but Christ is there to rescue and pull you out of the pit. When I use the word, I'm going to skip a few verses here just for sake of time. Hebrew metaphor, literally the verb lifted in this passage refers to drawing a bucket of water out of a well. You ever looked down a well? You ever looked down a well in your life? What do you see? Nothing. It's dark. And so the interpretation here is that it gives a picture of pulling up a bucket out of the well and bringing it up with this water, refreshing water to drink. Listen, when Christ has pulled you out of the pit, when he's rescued you from Satan, I can remember that day. It was like taking on a cold cup of water from the well. I was lifted up, and I was dry, I was parched, and I was dead. And Christ brought my soul 
to life. And if you'll recall, maybe you'll get re-energized this morning. Remember I said it's rescued and re-energized? My prayer this morning is that you would be re-energized as we go into the Easter season, that you'll recall your moment of being rescued. And times where Christ has continued to rescue through your life. So David says, God has drawn me out of the pit, the darkness, and not let my enemies rejoice over my demise. I love that. Not only has he saved me, God protects me from my enemies. See, some of you get saved, and you think you have to live this life by yourself and do things by yourself, but God is there all the time with you. God is with us. Number two, write this down, point two. I skipped over a few verses to take a time up there, so they're on the screen. If you want to write them down, look at them later, you go right ahead. Jesus rescues us from sickness. Do you get that? Look at verse 2. Oh, Lord, my God, I call to you for help, and you what? Healed me. He healed me, right? Listen, I believe there's many times... You know anything about war, anything about being outside in the elements, anytime you look at people at war on TV, look at what's going on in Ukraine. People are banged up, they're bruised, they get bandaged up, their, their spirits are crushed, their, their physical bodies have ailments. And so I believe that David experienced illness and injury as part of his calling as a commander of the army. But I also believe this passage is to stop right there. I believe God can heal us with our greatest needs that we have. The greatest needs you have is to be healed. See, God is our physician. He declares in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord, your healer. Think about that for a minute. I am the Lord, your healer. Psalm 103, 3, He heals all your diseases. Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes we are healed. That's a good Easter time scripture, isn't it? But here's what I love. Those are Old Testament passages, right? And it carries through in the New Testament for healing that we also see. 1 Peter 2, 24 says this, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin. By his wounds you have been healed. Do you get that? By his wounds. So what type of healing am I talking about? Spiritual healing. Thank you. Crystal got the answer right. If I had a piece of candy, I'd give it to you, Crystal. The kind of healing that the world needs today is not just physical healing. It is the spiritual healing, right? Jesus rescues us from the, the sickness of our sin that requires spiritual healing. And Christ is the only one that can deliver that healing to this church and to the world. Christ has accomplished for us spiritual healing. And your response should be, praise God. Your response should be, I am thankful to the Lord for the salvation of my soul, for healing my soul because I was a dead man walking. Do you remember that? And the problem is we get bored with church because we forget that Christ delivered us, He rescued us, and He healed us spiritually. And we should be able to shout out, thank you God for healing my sickness from sin's curse. So who needs a spiritual healer, healing? Well, Mark 2.17, it says this, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Sinners need spiritual healing. Who is a sinner? Those who live apart from Christ. Those who, the sound of my voice, need spiritual healing. Every morning I get up, I guarantee I'm going to do something stupid that can qualify probably as sin, and I need spiritual revival and healing in my life. And so I repent. And I ask God to restore and renew me what's going on in my life. So let me ask you a question this morning. Do you realize you're spiritually sick? Are you spiritually healthy this morning? He said, well, Pastor Early, I'm saved. Well, praise God. 
But has your mind been transformed to become like Christ? Are you, has your behaviors been changed to act like Christ? Oh boy, he's starting to preach, he's getting into meddling now. Right, he's starting to meddle. See, the problem is, the problem is once I'm saved, I think I'm done changing. But it is a lifelong journey of healing in our life spiritually that we become more like Christ. And I think David understood that he wanted to please God. And, and when he got arrogant, God dealt with David, like I told you. He didn't let him get away with much, but God did show grace and mercy to David. And God disciplines us sometimes. But listen to me. God is full of grace and mercy for you, and he loves you. All right? He loves you. He provides that healing. Here's what I want you to know this morning. You can be healed today. Trust in Christ. His wounds, his stripes, his sacrificially atoning death in your place on the cross. He did all that so each person in the sound of my voice could be spared the wrath of God in their life. Turn your Bible real quick to verse 5. I want to get this. This is important. Psalm 34, verse 5. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Listen, before you were saved, you were under God's wrath. It was for a moment. When you became a born-again Christian, you are now part of God's favor. You've experienced God's favor by accepting Christ in your life. You are a favored child of God. Do you believe that? Do you receive that this morning? You say, well, Pastor Arley, what about physical healing? You mentioned David was probably healed, and God dealt with David's spirit in this passage, it appears. But what about physical healing? I found this quote I thought it was appropriate. And I want you to hear this. I don't know if it's on the screen or not. I can't remember if I put it up there or not. God heals everyone who belongs to him. His plan is to heal us completely by raising these weak bodies from the death. Did you get that type of healing? To raise our weak bodies from death. God gives lesser healings in his, this life sometimes. What am I saying? The reality is that our ultimate healing, and I'll talk more about this in another quote here, is when we see Christ face to face. When our bodies are resurrected in the second coming, we will experience our full healing. Don't diminish God's healing through death as it is second best. Some people think because God doesn't heal you physically today that God doesn't like you and he has it out for you. And nothing can be further from the truth. God loves you and that doesn't change anything because you're not being healed physically. You have the potential for healing, the Bible says. And we'll talk more about that. But you have the promise of the ultimate healing comes when God raises his loved ones from the dead, just like he raised Christ from the dead. Did you get all that? Somebody say amen. Because my concern is, we've been taught a whole lot of bad things on TV about healing in the name of claim it gospel. We've got to be careful. Jesus rescues us from our sicknesses. He does. He rescues us. Let's go to the next slide, please. So since he rescues us from his sicknesses, the question is, what do we do for healing now? He said there's potential that we could be healed. Well, in James 5, 13 to 18, when I came back to start preaching again a while back, this is my last sermon I preached from James 5. As I had to close out the book in James. And so what I took, gave you was four points of possible healing. What do we do, Right? We are God's child, and we want to be healed. We are suffering, we go to him for healing. We have success, we go to Christ for healing. But we have, you say, why success? Because here's the danger. What was David's problem when he went to war and he came out? He wanted to have a consensus because pride, because of the success. I would submit to you that sometimes when we are successful, it can cause us to sin. Just like David. And we need prayer for healing that our spirit does not become so um, arrogant that we sin against God. 
And so we need the elders to pray for us that we would be humble and give God the glory and give Him thanks. He said, I've never heard anybody doing that. I, I didn't ask you if you did. I'm just at, telling you that that's a real trap from Satan. Success can be. We, we have healing available to us when we are sick physically. I believe clearly in physical healing. I believe that God can heal David. I believe God can heal you this morning of your physical ailments. Now, whether he does or not, it's his decision. My job is to pray by faith that you will be made well. The outcome of that is out of my hands. The elders are not the healers. I am not the healer. Christ is our healer. We believe that solidly in the CMA. And then if we're trapped by sin, if there is a sin that is you are trapped in, and you don't want to tell anybody, but you know that it's wrecked your life, and you think you're getting away with it, you're not because it's eating at your soul. You need to be delivered. You need to cry out for help like David does. Humble yourself before the Lord and, and cry for His mercy this morning. So we're rescued from Satan. We're rescued from sickness. And the third point, somebody say amen. Jesus rescues from our sadness. Verse 5b. All right? Look at that verse. I think it's one of my favorite verses of the psalm. Listen to the psalm. You ready? Weeping lasts for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I've been attacked by Satan, David says. Right? He's been put in a bad situation of despair. He's been sick. Requires some type of healing. It doesn't say exactly what it was. We have that same power available to us to be healed. But I want you to hear, weeping lasts for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Listen to me. Being saved does not always mean your sadness is removed. <gasps> but aren't Christians supposed to be happy, happy, happy? Yes, that's a good thing. But also we need to be real. If we're depressed, let's confess it. If we're suicidal, let's confess it. Let's get help. If you're in despair, if you're in sin, and you're sad, let's confess it. See, Christ never says anywhere in the Bible, come follow me and you'll never cry again. You'll never be sad again. Well, Pastor Early, that's not what I heard on TV. I hear if you, if you come to Christ, you'll always be happy. I have a Hebrew word for that. You ready for it? Wait. Sadness will not be fully eradicated until the new heaven and earth come. Amen? I've lived this life for 58 years, been saved since I was 17. And I can tell you, I've had some sad seasons of my life. I've had family members die. We've had marital issues along the way. Right? If you've been married more than two days, you've got marital issues. Because you have two sinners trying to live together. Good luck on that one. It's only through the power of Christ that we even stand a chance in these marriages. But God has been merciful and graceful. And he's brought us through many hardships in our lives. Revelation 21.4 He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain from the, for the old order of things have passed away. But for now, they're still weeping. But for now, there will be still sadness. But for now, you don't have to be sad alone. God is with you. Perhaps you know somebody this year. You know somebody this year that has had a rough time. And they've, they've had cancer. And they've had COVID. Or they're going through a divorce. And their heart is breaking because relationships have shattered and it causes sadness because of sin in this world. But God is greater than all of that. He can deliver you from that sadness. But let's be honest. Sadness is real. 
It is a season, but joy comes in the morning. There is hope in Christ. Don't stop serving the Lord. Don't stop coming to worship. Don't stop praising His name. Be like David. Praise the Lord even in the bad times. Amen? See, see the, the shortest verse in the Bible is when Lazarus died, right? I think it's John eleven thirty five. I did not check this reference. John eleven thirty five. All you pastor verse checkers, you can check me on this, okay? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Lazarus had died, but joy came in the morning. Lazarus died. When he arrived at the tomb, he said, Lazarus, come out. And what happened to Lazarus? He got out. He got up. Now I'm going to stop there because that's probably my Easter message. I don't want to get, get ahead of my game here, right? And also when Jesus himself hung on the cross, was crucified for our sin, was buried and put in the earth, and the, the stone was rolled closed, and people are weeping and crying because they were sad. What happened? The Bible says this. The women went to visit his tomb, and the angel of the Lord said, Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping and seeking the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And your response is? That was weak. You got to work it out between now and Easter. All right? He is risen indeed. Absolutely. So I don't know what has you crying this morning. I don't know what has you sad this morning. You know what's going on in each other's lives. Many of you do. But I will tell you, hold on. Because morning's coming. Joy's coming. Your sadness is a season. It does have to be a place where you live. It does have to be a place where you go home to and say, I'm going to just get comfortable in my sadness and die here. That is not God's best for your life. But you may go through seasons of depression and despair and loneliness and heartache and all these things and sickness. But joy comes in the morning. I love verse 11. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Listen, when God delivers me from Satan, I am joyful, right? When God delivers me from sickness, I am joyful. When God delivers me from um, this, this sadness sometimes, I am joyful. I am grateful. And our attitude should be, and I want to encourage the church, Church, your heart may sing to you, O oh God. Not, do not let me be silent. I will give you thanks forever. Verse, verse 12. I was going to continue on, but I'm done. That's it. So whatever you need prayer for this morning, whatever is on your heart this morning, I want to encourage the church that joy is coming to you in the morning. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But our joy is in Christ. He saved us. He keeps us. He secures us. He delivers us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are God who hears our prayers. Thank you, Lord, that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Christ is Lord. And at that statement, I bow my knee, my heart to you and recognize without you in our lives, we are in trouble this morning. Father, thank you for communion table. Thank you for your saints who bring encouragement to our souls. Thank you for the body of Christ and the church that that I can go to and I can talk to and confess my sins and they pray for me. Church, if you're here this morning and you need prayer, raise your hand. I don't want to pray for you right now. Anyone all for salvation, for sickness, for sadness, whatever you're feeling, just raise your hand right now. I want to pray. I see your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else? Come on now. See, oh God, help me. It's like David. Oh God, help me. Father, we humbly ask that you would help us this morning. Lift us out of our despair. Help us look to the cross of Christ. Help us look to Christ alone for the joy of our salvation. 
And Lord, for those who are going through the stormy fire right now and the waters of this life right now and the turbulence of relationships right now, I pray that you would bring them joy in the morning. I pray blessings over them. I pray that you would hear their cry and that they would wake up tomorrow morning and they recognize that you've touched them. You've healed their sad heart or sickness that they need and they're struggling with it. You would deliver them from that as well. Father, thank you for delivering us from Satan's penalty of sin. Thank you for Christ, his victor in his life, life in my life. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.